scripture from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hands of the warrior. So are the children of youth, one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Amen. Our students are going to Children's Church. Amen. So I understand that it is still November, but we are jumping, as I said, full throttle, both feet, into Christmas. And let me tell you why. It's not because as soon as the tree goes up at my house, I'm concerned about what gifts are going to go under it. Because I'll be honest with you, Miss Winnie and I do not buy each other gifts. Our children, our children do not buy us gifts. I tell my children that are now, most of them are grown and gone. When they do mess around and ask me what I want for Christmas, I'll tell them, well, you can't afford it. And then the next answer is, I don't want presents. I want presents. I want you to sit on the couch with me, and we're going to prop our feet up, and we're going to play on our phones, and we're going to bump our heads together, and I'm going to reach over and I'm going to hold your hand a minute. I'm going to spend as much time with you as I can. Because can, can I say something that sounds kind of depressing? Are you ready? I have I spent more time with my children from 0 to 18 than I will from 18 to the time I die. So now, I want to be around them as much as possible. I don't want Christmas up early because... As I said, I'm worried about the gifts that, are, that I'm going to get. So we, we don't give gifts. I'm excited about Christmas is because the two times that people are most receptive to the gospel, in my estimation, are Easter and Christmas. And I'll be honest with you. I think the church has lost Easter. Let me tell you why. There was a day that no, if you, if you, even if you didn't have a play, even if you didn't have anything for them to show up for, people would show up on Easter Sunday. They'd go out and they'd buy new rags. I'm not saying you have to have new rags to come to church. Please do not hear what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Wear what you got. But they would, everybody had their, their Mary Janes and their patent lit. You understand what I'm talking about. Everybody went and bought a ham. Easter was a big, fat, hairy deal. Now it's just another weekend holiday. So I think Christmas is still, it still has power and influence in, in our world. Okay. So I am excited and want to begin Christmas because I feel like the heart of most people is most tender and receptive to the birth of the Christ child. And this right here, you understand they used to put stained glass windows in before people could read and write so they could tell stories. It was like a picture book for the church. This right here, the birth of the Christ child. So yes, we're going to celebrate Christmas at just as soon as Thanksgiving's over, and we're going to celebrate it until old Christmas. And I'm going to preach about old Christmas, and we're going to have old-timey goodie bags, and I'm going, we're going to have a water baptism, and we're going to have communion, and we're going to have baby dedications, and we're going to monopolize the most fertile time of the year for us to spread the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the birth of the Christ child. The, here's the 50-cent word I learned. Mr. George and I were somewhere a week or so ago. The epiphany of the Christ, the birth of the Christ child unto the timeline of humanity. Amazing, improbable, unbelievable. So this year's theme is believe. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 1. Let me give you a challenge. Let me give you a challenge. If you have children, grandchildren, or children you might like sometimes, go ahead and prepare them and tell them, on Christmas morning, whatever day you open gifts as a family, go ahead and prepare them on Christmas morning. We are going to read Luke chapter 2 and pray before we open gifts. Now, your children and your family is not going to like that. That's going to be very inconvenient because you can't get them up for school to save your life, but they'll be up before the chickens on Christmas morning, won't they? Start a tradition of reading the Christmas story and praying. 
Ken, I can't say some of those words in Luke chapter 2. Then download the Bible app and let it read it out loud for you. Make your children, make your family do something you've never done before to get results you've never had before. Okay, you want me to finish? Okay. So does everyone else. So does everyone else, darling. So we're laying the groundwork today for our theme of believe with the Christmas play on the 17th and then communion and Christmas service on the 24th. Luke chapter 1 bouncing around between Luke 1 and Luke 2. So let's go to Luke chapter 1. But be prepared to do that with your family. They can't get enough scripture. Your children and grandchildren should know. Adults, watch this. Let's talk about the adults. The adults should know scripture as good as we know our favorite baseball stat or our favorite lyric to our favorite song or you may keep going. I'll, I'll run up on something that you really love and you've got memorized. For if we hide his word in our hearts, we might not sin against God. Amen. Luke chapter 1. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Luke chapter 2. This is the one you're going to read with your family. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all the people were on their way to register for the census, each to his own city. Now, Joseph also went up from Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. In order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly frightened. And so the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For this day in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. 
and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army of angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among people of, with whom he is pleased. When the angels had departed from them into the heavens, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in a manger. When they had seen them, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed about the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as, just as had been told to them. And when the eight days were completed so that it was time for his circumcision, he was also named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name. As we prepare our hearts for what you have prepared for us, let us reflect on the gift, the grace, the epiphany, the miracle of the Christ child, and what your birth means for all humanity. We gather here to reinforce our belief that we believe. We believe it all. Anoint lips of clay today, Lord. To bring you glory, praise, and honor. In Christ's name, amen. When thinking about the Christmas narrative, we have this, we have this romanticized version of what it was like. We see this, a neat stable, the baby, Mary, she's doing fine. You know, she's just had a baby. She's doing fine. Joseph's got his hand up there. Oh, wow, this is awesome. But how many of y'all know in the moments after a birth, it's not awesome? It is, but it's not. When you do research, the best word we can come up for, come up with in English is manger, but there are synonyms for that word, and that word is a feeding trough. And since wood was not as abundant as it is in, the, in, in our part of the world, how many of you know in our part of the world, everything is built with wood. Everything in the old world is built with stone, right? Uh, Miss Winnie and I went to, to England um, before I got out of the military. Long story. I'm standing in line behind somebody at the fish and chip shop. I like fish and chips. And um, the lady, who said I like everything? Who said, okay, praise the Lord. Um, <laughs> The lady in front of me and the lady behind me recognized each other, and they're having a conversation. And instead of me saying, you go ahead, I was hungry. So, but she was, they were talking, and she said, I heard you bought the so-and-so old place. And she said, yes, honey, and it is so nice. It is only 300 years old. In England, that's new because it's made of stone, Right? The manger was most likely not made of wood that he was laid in. It was probably a chiseled out or a worn out rock. Probably the area that they stayed in was not like a, a horse stable or somewhere that you could button up real tight. It was probably under the ledge of an outcropping of rock. There were people everywhere because of the census. How many of y'all like driving in traffic? How would you like to be bumper to bumper with mules and horses and people? Because that's what was happening. Holiday traffic, except it was on beasts of burden. You're pregnant. You are very pregnant. And you've ridden, hopefully, Joe let her ride, on a beast of burden probably having Braxton Hicks, dehydrated, slightly dehydrated, hungry. 
and go in labor by yourself with just your husband. With animals around. Probably 14. 13 to 15 is the guesstimate. And all of you, you can ride up and down the roads in Sampson County and smell the money in the air sometimes. But she gave birth. So all of those beasts of burden and animals were there. You know that stable or whatever we call a stable was full of animals. So they basically, now I'm, this, is, this is what I'm reading into it, but there, some things are common sense. They probably had to make an area, make, to make something happen. Joseph, this baby's coming, and I got to lay down. There's nowhere else we can lay down in the, beside the animals. So it wasn't, it's not as romanticized as we think it is. And I am sure that when Mary said, I am your servant, your bond servant, I will do as you please, her and Joseph had no idea what they were signing up for. Pastor Rick Warren says it this way, what do you do when God messes up your plans? Because all of us have plans. Anybody ever had a plan that was foolproof until God told you you're not doing any of that? What do you do when God messes up your plans? I have, I have three things I want to talk about. What happens if God messes up your plans? Situations that quickly seem to spiral completely out of control. If God messes up your plans, perhaps he's trying to get your attention. You heard me say during more our stewardship series that I'm a firm believer that our greatest blessing as a nation has become our greatest curse. And I used as an illustration, back before there was easy credit and you could buy whatever you want, whenever you wanted it without thinking about if you could afford it, people used to have to work for something before they bought it. People used to depend on the rain that fell from the sky, and if God did not provide it, their crops failed. People used to have to get way up before daylight and stay way up after bedtime to make sure all the animals and everything was taken care of because if you didn't, you're not going to eat that winter. And there was always something to do. There was water to be pumped. There were animals to be fed and cleaned or stalls to be mucked. Now, our greatest blessings become our greatest curse, but people never miss church. Now we have, we are one of, at, at, we are one of the most wealthiest nations in the world. And I think when I was doing my stewardship research, somewhere in the ballpark of 50% of Americans have less than $1,000 in the bank at any given time. They're not prepared for a $1,000 emergency. Where's that money going? I understand it's hard to live for some families, but some people just waste money. Perhaps God messes up your plans because he's trying to get your attention. Number two, perhaps he has a much better plan than you have for your life. Or number three, he wants you to learn to trust him. Let's get into, let's get into those. If God messes up your plans, perhaps he's trying to get... Your attention. If God messes up your plans, he's trying to get your attention. All parents, listen to this one really well. I can't remember who it was. It was Aristotle or one of those great philosophers that are known in Greco-Roman culture. If he really had a real important point he wanted to make, now I, I don't know if this is true, but this is common legend, he would call his student up to him and he would slap the stew out of him and then he'd tell him what he wanted to teach him. Because he learned a long time ago, if I get your attention that way, you're liable to not forget it. How many of y'all remember the first time you got burnt? <laughs> Perhaps God is trying to get your attention. Have you ever snatched a knot in one of your children and said, you better pay attention to me when I'm talking to you? In Mary and Joseph's case, the plan of God was so fantastic and unbelievable. And so once in a lifetime kind of event that God used supernatural intervention 
to convince them. In Luke chapter 1, we saw that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the virgin who was betrothed to a man, and her name was Mary. She was greeted by the angel. She was perplexed, and the angel said, Do not be afraid. But Mary was not, Matthew chapter 1, Mary was not the only one to see an angel. Matthew chapter 1, go there for me, please, Mr. Alex. Mary was not the only one to see an angel. It's just the only one listed in Luke in the, the book of Luke. In Matthew chapter 1, in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Mary was not the only one to see an angel. I've never seen an angel. Joseph had an angel appear to him in a dream. I've never heard an angel speak audibly. And thankfully, most of the time, we really don't need angels to speak to us anymore. Ever since the death, burial, and resurrection of the Christ, the Bible says, if you believe Jesus, anybody believe what Jesus said? Jesus said, I will send a comforter, that is the Holy Spirit, who will be your guide. And I don't need an angel if I have the God, if I have God speaking to me. I don't need one of his servants speaking to me if God is speaking to me. So I've never seen one, I've never heard one, and we really don't have a need for them to speak to us in our day and time because the Bible says the Holy Spirit searches the mind and the will of God and will help us lead us into the will of God. Because God is always talking to us, the question is, are we listening? God is always talking to us, are we listening? We are born with our radio tuned to WIIFM, WIIFM. What's in it for me? You have to allow the Holy Spirit to change the station because right now there's, there's, there's pornographic um, signals coming through this building. There's Christian radio coming through this building. There's satellite. If you had the right receiver, you can get anything you want in this building except you can't get internet, but that's another story. Your temple... If you're living right, the Holy Spirit is guiding you. If you're not living right, the Holy Spirit is trying to. Very few people have no knowledge of the presence of God. Okay? So if you are de-churched, unchurched, uh, not following Christ or following Christ, the Holy Spirit is always, the Bible, we used to use a word called wooing. The Holy Spirit is wooing you. It's pursuing you in a loving way. C come, come back to faith. G get, get right with God before the time is too late. If you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit's going to sound a lot like, it would be wise if you did not do that. It would be wise if you did that. It will be wise if you kept your mouth shut. It will be wise if you said the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will give you the words you need to say when you don't know what to say. Say this right now. You cannot compete. Your, your, the world cannot compete with the Holy Spirit empowering you. But listen, you have to listen to Him. You have to listen to Him. The Holy Spirit is always talking. Are we listening? If God messes up your plans, perhaps he's trying to get your attention. But sometimes we are so blinded by our own self-will that we can't see what God wants to do outside of those blinders. The joke I make um, is that um, every preacher I know feels led 
to leave their church and pastor in Hawaii at a church of four or five hundred people with a you know a three or four hundred thousand dollar a year salary and a parsonage on the beach. Everybody feels led to go there. Nobody feels led to go to an American Indian church plant on the Navajo Nation to have 12 people when they all show up. Nobody feels led to go there. Are you listening or are you praying and packing? That's the joke amongst preachers. Are you praying if you're supposed to leave your church and packing at the same time? Because if you're praying and packing, your mind's already made up, right? Perhaps the Lord is trying to get your attention. Are you listening? Are you listening? Because sometimes we are not listening. Have you ever found yourself not listening? If you don't listen, if you pay attention to anyone, you should pay attention to God. Number two, if God messes up your plans, he has a much better plan for your life. If God messes up your plans, he has a much better plan for your life. I cannot tell you the number of times I had it all planned out. And when the Lord, I allow the Lord to mess it up because I believe, okay, I'm willing to be wrong. I believe there's a perfect will of God and a permissive will of God. I believe there's a perfect will of God and I believe there's a permissive will of God. That God will let you do certain things even though it's not his perfect will for you. And let me give you an illustration. Do any of you have children or ever been a child? And you're like, like... Have you ever done something or your children done something you really knew was an unwise thing to do, but, you let, but they did it anyway and you let them? I think our Heavenly Father says, my perfect will for you is this. If you do contrary to this, I still love you, but that is not my perfect will. And I'm afraid there's a lot of people, they are going to make it to heaven. And the Lord's going to say, you were called to be a great evangelist. But I was, a, a, I was the best welder in the county. I didn't call you to be a welder. I called you to be an evangelist. But I attended church and I paid my tithes and I was a deacon. I did not call you to be a welder. I called you to be an evangelist. There's going to be people who get to heaven and God say, what a wonderful testimony you had as a welder. And they said, I want a welder. I was a preacher. I was called to preach. He said, I didn't call you to preach. I called you to be a welder and be a Christian welder in a world that needed Christian welders and be a deacon and pay your tithes and attend church regularly. What is the permissive will and what's the perfect will? Because sometimes God will mess up your plans because he has a much better plan for you. Everybody here, most of you, had an incredible meal at some point last week. In some way, shape, form, or fashion, you had plenty of food and more than you knew what to do with, and you almost wondered if you should have repented because you ate so much. Anybody else was there? Anybody else been there? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now just imagine. We're going to say Thanksgiving lunch is the, is the time we're going to set for this illustration, okay? I understand Thanksgiving lunch means some things to some people and some things to others. But if you tell me to be here at 1 o'clock, the food better be red eye at 1 o'clock. And I'm glad to help get it there. But don't be putting the bird in the oven at 1250. Y'all ain't listening to me. I ain't eat since Monday. And I, I'm showing up to eat at 1 o'clock. I show up and say, I've got day-old bread, and my bologna ain't got a name. And I'm making bologna and onion and ketchup sandwiches for anybody who wants it. And everybody in the house is going, we have turkey and dressing. and I got, what I, I got my plan. I got my plan. I got day-old bread that needs to be toasted. But it's my, it's my plan. And your family, those who love you, say, please don't eat that stuff today. I ain't saying throw it away. I'm just saying toast that bread tomorrow and fry that bologna and make it hot tomorrow. You can, if all the food's gone, you can do something tomorrow. But today, eat with us. What if your plan is stale bread and bologna with no name? And God wants you to eat at his table. And instead... You've got your mind made up. Perhaps when he messes up your plans, he's trying to get your attention. Perhaps he has a much better plan for you. Have you considered that? Several times in Psalms 81, God says, I wish my people would listen to me. In Psalms 81, that's, that's when you break it down. I wish my people would listen to me. Now, we know the frustration of, of anybody ever had a child not listen to you, you not listen to your parents? 
I'm sure none of you have ever dealt with that. God says he wants his children to listen to him. Several times in Psalms 81, he says that. We get ourselves in trouble when we think we know better than God. Any of you know better than your parents? How, how old were you when you realized you didn't know everything? Because when I was 18, I knew everything, Dennis. I knew everything. And the older I get, Dennis, the more I realize my parents, I think they were cool one time before they had my brother and I. <laughs> they might have had, you know, they, they may have even owned some things that were nice before my brother and I were born. My brother, are y'all ready for this? My brother and I, at where my daddy worked, they called my brother and I crash and burn. My daddy said we could tear up a cast iron billy goat. One time, y'all remember, y'all remember the little the little bubble gum machines with the glass balls on the top? Daddy gave us a nickel, which was a big fat hairy deal when I was a boy, and told my brother and I to go get some bubble gum while he went to go pick up his paycheck. We were fighting over who's going to put the money in, and we pulled the bubble gum machine off in front of everybody, and it busted and went everywhere. Wait, the story gets better. My daddy goes to turn around to walk out of HR's office, and my brother and I are on our hands and knees cramming glass and, and bubble gum in our pockets, hard as we can go. Y'all ever done anything like that? I'm sure none of y'all have ever done anything like that. God's people, God wants his children to listen to him just like my parents wanted me to listen to them. And the only reason, can I, this is a sidebar, the only reason I'm not under the jail is because I didn't have an ability to record it, proof of it, because I'd have sent it to all my buddies. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You're going to pretend like you just didn't get caught. <laughs> God wants his children to listen to him. And no matter how, how old you are, your heavenly father has wisdom for you. But some of us think we know better than our heavenly father. Just like we thought we knew better than our daddy or our mama. How many men here, I can't speak to the women, how many men here ever tried your daddy? Like, come on daddy, we're going outside and, and one of us is going to be broke of a bad habit. And you decided you wanted to fist fight your daddy. I'm dumb as a box of hammers, but let me tell y'all something. I'm not going to try to fight my daddy. One of my daddy's friends pulled me to the side when I was about 15 years old. He said, son, you're getting kind of big now, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you something. Before you were born, I've seen your daddy fight, and you don't want to fight your daddy. Newsom said, your daddy will crawl you like a squirrel. Why did I bring that up? Because as dumb as I am, I never tried my daddy. I listened to my daddy even when I didn't agree with him. Are you listening to me? Do you listen to your heavenly father even when you don't agree with him? Perhaps he has a much better plan. We get in trouble when we think we know better than God. We read the word of God and we say that's not relevant or it does not apply to me. And that is the devil lying to you. I don't have to follow that scripture. Oh, so for thousands of years of human history, you're the only one that that scripture does not apply to. But we believe that, and we go against what the Father says. Proverbs 16 and 24 says, All a man's ways are clear, clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs his motives. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of the way is death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of the way is death. All of us have been in situations where everybody was telling us, everybody that cared about you was telling you, listen, it's not my business, but don't do that. It's not my business, but do not get into that. It's not my business, but do not go out with her. It's not my business, do not go out with him. It's not my business, but I care about you and do not do that. And everybody, listen, thus saith the Lord, no matter how old you are, if everyone who loves you, listen to that word, if everyone who loves you around you was saying, you probably ought not to do that, you probably ought not to listen to the person that's going to benefit from you doing it. Now, if you're listening, that was worth the trip. 
If everybody's around you saying don't spend money on that and the person that's selling it to you is convinced you you need it, you probably ought to listen to the people that love you. Your heavenly father is constantly, that's why it's so important to have a church. To have people that love you enough. How many of y'all know that love is not love until we work through a disagreement? Erickson said, right. All the ways of a man seem clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs his motives. There's a way that seems right to a man, but ends in death. A lot of things in life look like the right thing, but when you get to the end, they're a dead end and a disaster. I think it was Andy Stanley, but don't quote me on that. He lives out... In California, and, and just the, the, the traffic out there is atrocious and construct. If you think they're working on the roads out here, anyway, ask somebody who lived. Anyway, it's just it's awful. Um, and he said, I know I shouldn't do this. He said, I'm a preacher. I shouldn't do this. I know I shouldn't do this. I should not have done it. I know I shouldn't have done it. But they were working on, I don't know. I'm going to say a number. This, the, the gist of the story is not the details, okay? But, like, they were working on eight lanes, and they had four blocked off. And it was new construction that they were putting eight lanes in a four lane. He said, and I swerved between the barrels. He said, and I'm just, I'm, I'm doing pretty work. I'm sure I'm rocketing. He said, and this dude starts following me, flashing his lights. And he was like, this dude is mad because I'm the first one to think about it. He said, and he keeps following me, he keeps flashing his lights, getting closer, flashing his lights, get closer, flashing his lights. And he gets up beside me and he goes like this, like this, and like this, and like this. And he says, I finally just stop out of frustration. He says, What? He said, he don't know I'm a preacher. <laughs> he says, dude, the bridge is not finished up here. There's a way that seems right unto you, but it ends in death. Have you ever had something sure fire or not fire at all? <laughs> Have you ever done anything in life and made a decision you thought, man, this is guaranteed. But it was all said and done. It's a gigantic loss. We've all had plans that had thought we should go a certain way, but they don't because we don't know the future. We don't have things that are going to turn out in spite of our plans. God wants his people to listen to him because God does know the future. What's so interesting to me is the Bible says he knows the end from the beginning. If I was writing a book, I'd have said he knows the beginning from the end. But the Bible says he knows the end from the beginning. That means when he started, when you were born, he knows how it ended before you were born. God exists outside of time. God doesn't worry about his knees messing up. God doesn't worry about having a bad tooth. God doesn't worry about his hair falling out. God existed outside of time. We don't even understand how that works because we are finite, time-restricted beings. Even if there were no clock, your body naturally it takes about 30 minutes for your eyeball to adjust from brighter light to darker light. And I don't think it's a coincidence that our sun takes about 30 to 45 minutes to set. 30 to 45 minutes to rise. Your, your body, there's a rhythm. And if you've ever worked night shift, you know what I'm talking about. Especially in the fall, you feel like a vampire. You go to work when it's dark and you get off when it's dark and you sleep during the daytime. But there is a rhythm even if we didn't have watches and clocks. God, does not, God is not bound by time. So your healing might not exist in time now, but it exists in eternity. It exists. So he still works signs, wonders, and miracles. Sometimes you get it on this side of eternity. Sometimes you get it on the other side of eternity. But it's not defined by our time restraints. Even if, you're for, even if, you're, even if you live to be 100, that's nothing. In 100 years after you pass away, most people will not know your name. In 150 to 200 years after you pass away, nobody will know your name. I don't know any of my people's names that far back. But obviously they were there because I'm here. I feel like I should know them, but I don't. What if God has a better plan for your life than what you have? Because God knows the end from the beginning. Detours, roadblocks, problems, and dangers can be seen by God. Watch this. 
this is difficult for us to understand. God not only knows the end from the beginning, God can see around the corner without looking around the corner. <laughs> I mean, it's true. You ever thought about, man, if I could just look around the corner, I'd see what's coming. But God, God doesn't even have to look around the corner to know what's around the corner. Has it ever occurred to you nothing's ever occurred to God? But we think our plans are better than his. If you listen to God, you can avoid an awful lot of pain and embarrassment in your life. You can avoid a whole lot of detours and roadblocks. The Bible is full of advice and counsel. And God's saying, if you do certain things, you'll be successful and satisfied and find meaning. See, we want, we want complicated things so we can subconsciously say, look what I did. Because if it were up to us, we would complicate it to make people earn the right to be saved. They would earn the right to God. But thank be unto God, we're not in charge. It's simple, so simple a child can understand it. Jesus said childlike faith, that we come to him in humility and childlike faith. If you do what God tells you, your life will be easier. If you do what God tells you to do and follow his advice and counsel, you'll be successful and satisfied and find meaning and not the meaning and satisfaction that the world offers. Because the world's message is totally anti-Christ to what Christ is saying. Read your Bible. Amen. Amen, Harrison. Amen. Harrison just said, read your Bible. Who? Oh, Alex said it. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I'm an Elliot. Alex is his cousin's name. Take all this off the tape. So this is Harrison, Elliot, Alex is his cousin. Then there's Tito, Marlon, and Jermaine. And then there's all kind of names. You're not really an old man if you call people the wrong name two or three times in a row, are you? Yeah. <laughs> not my pastor. Um, does anybody know what I was talking about? Because I've obviously lost what I was talking about. Read your, Bible. Read your Bible. Yes, amen. Read your Bible, people. The Bible's being fulfilled right in front of your eyes. Turn to whatever your favorite news broadcast is off. Turn your favorite talk radio show host off. And if you don't, if you can't read, some people can't read good. There's no shame in that. Let the Bible read to you. Well, Ken, I don't get everything that I hear when I read the Bible. You don't know what you had to eat last Sunday for supper, but it sustained you, didn't it? Listen to it whether or not you understand it or not. Because watch this, spoiler alert, you're never going to understand it till you start listening to it. You want a self-fulfilling prophecy, I don't understand the Bible, that's why I don't read it. Well, if you don't read it, you're never going to understand it. And watch this, you have, most of you have a smartphone. Now, some of you don't, that's fine, but most of you do. You can now Googleize what does this verse mean. And it'll tell you. And if you're not sure if it's true, you can always call your pastor. Read your Bible because God's Word is full of wisdom, favor. And the Bible says if you do certain things, you're going to end up in misery, guilt, resentment, broken, pain, suffering, anger, and problems. But God does not tell us what to do or what not to do because He is not a cosmic cop or some celestial bully or cosmic killjoy. God does it because He loves us. God's like the mother who tells us, don't touch that hot stove because he loves us. God says, if you listen to me, I can make your life a whole lot easier. We just read that there's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in death. God says, if you listen to me, I'll help you. If God messes up your plans... Maybe he has a better plan for your life. The Bible is very clear that every person was made with a purpose. 
God designed us uniquely, and you have a reason for being on the earth. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Too many people think that if they start following God and surrender their life to Christ, he's going to make their lives miserable. If you become a Christian and become miserable, then you got religion. You didn't get Christ. Because Jesus does not take your brain out and, you're a, and you are a mindless drone that does whatever the pastor says. No, you are living in freedom and guilt-free and you're going to sleep the best you've ever slept and you're walking in the perfect will of God. It gives you freedom beyond your understanding. That's not what the Bible teaches, that God's not going to do that. He has a good plan for us. God's plan for us is always bigger than our plans because he has a total perspective and we just have one piece of the puzzle. Mary and Joseph wanted to get married and settle down and be a nice, happy family. But God said, I'm going to step into the timeline of humanity through you. God made us with purpose and we have a choice. And we have no idea how much God wants to work through us and how much he could do through you if you were totally committed to his plan and surrender your life rather than give him scraps and tips. When was the last time you gave God what he asked for and not just a tip? Some people are still giving God scraps and tips and think he's, he's happy with that. He is not. If he is Lord, if he is the master of your life, what would your life look like if you were totally surrendered to Christ? What would your life look like if you were totally surrendered to Christ? God's plans are always bigger than our plans. The other side of that coin, though, is that God's plans for your life are always harder than you planned. I'm going to stop in just a minute, but don't you think about that. God's plans for your life are always bigger than and better for your life. But the other side of the coin is that God's plan for your life is always harder than you planned it to be. That's why so many Christians bail on him. I could tell you by name if I was not under promise to not repeat it. The Christians who, I'm thinking of one particular, who's praying for God to miraculously and supernaturally intervene in a physical ailment in their body. And because God did not answer her prayer in a certain amount of time, she quit going to church and she fell out with God and she's no longer... Um, worshiping God anywhere in a church. So many people bail on him because human beings by nature are lazy. We're lazy. I mean, let's be honest. If you could draw the salary you're drawing and not do anything, wouldn't you do it? Amen. Sleep to the crack of noon. Find something to do. Dust your precious moments, precious memory collection or something. Do baseboards eventually. Catch up on all your TV shows. We are natured to use the least amount of energy to produce the most amount of benefit to us. But God wants us to grow our he wants us to grow out of comfort into your character. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. God is more interested in your character than you being comfortable. God is more interested in your character than he is in you being comfortable. God wants you to grow up into your full potential. He wants you to mature. He wants you to be a person of character, integrity, and take responsibility as a Christian. Instead of saying, yeah, but they, you say, yeah, but the Lord dealt with me and fill in the blank. When life is too easy, you become a spoiled brat. And if you always get everything you wanted the way you wanted it, eventually... It would all be worthless. You have to have resistance to produce character. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. Stand with me. Bow your heads. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for another day as we pause to celebrate and reflect on the wonder and the grace of Christmas that what happens when you mess up our plans. Lord, perhaps you mess up our plans because you're trying to get up our, our attention. Perhaps you mess up our plans because you have a much better plan for our life. And I know, Lord, that you want to are more concerned about our character than our comfort. Holy Spirit, today, help us, Lord, to be more concerned about our character than our 
creature comforts. And if there's one here today that doesn't know Christ and would like to receive him before we go today, I'd love to meet you at the front. Is there anyone here before we go? Then I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he give you peace and grace and bring you back the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. Make sure you sign up for the Christmas party and shake hands with two or three people. You're dismissed.